for what we're doing specifically with the superhero homework when you're going to be figuring out what's going on. So what we're going to do is converting between units. The thinking in units lecture is also um, up so you guys can kind of also see other ways to think about this. But for now, let's go ahead and get going. So the first concept we're going to work with is force. Now, force equals the mass of the object times its acceleration. So obviously, force is something that we're going to be producing quite frequently whenever we're moving. That's literally how we move. We produce force. Our muscles are going to pull on the tendons, which is creating a force, which is moving the bones, which in turn is going to move us. Interesting. Um, that's okay. Just use, just look around the book because we're really just looking at the basics of the, it should be also the subheading of getting a move on in Burkett chapter three. If it is not, then just go ahead and look around so you find the one that is matching. So now if we're working with an athlete and we're trying to figure out, well, how quickly are they accelerating? Well, if we know how much force they're producing, and we know how much they weigh, their mass, we in turn are going to actually be able to figure out, obviously, how quickly they're going to go ahead and move. So the greater the amount of force relative to the mass, the greater the acceleration. So if we're working with an athlete and our goal is to increase their acceleration, what are the two things we can do with their training in order to effectively get them a better acceleration? using this formula, bingo. We can either get them to become stronger or we can get them to lose weight, A or B. And quite possibly we can do both. Depends on who we're working with. If you're working with someone who's already pretty lean, well, our only option is to increase force. And with that increasing force, that's gonna be through things like strength training, potentially some plyometric training. Congratulations, now they're gonna be faster. Or if we have someone that has some mass they can lose, then obviously we can help them lose specifically fat mass, and that's gonna allow them to be faster. If we're losing muscle mass, in reality, we're probably not gonna make them faster. We're just gonna make them smaller and a worse athlete, and quite possibly having some issues with uh, behaviors and nutrition. So if you understand the force equals mass times acceleration formula, you understand the reasons why we work out, why we lift weights and the importance of being able to increase that total force capability of an athlete, because here's the thing, if we're trying to throw a shot put further, can we make the shot put any lighter? No. So we literally are left with, we've got to figure out a way to increase our force production. Now, that doesn't always necessarily mean we need to get stronger. That means we can always become better at producing that force. So that's becoming a technical change. But at the same time, it's showing you the importance of force and why we care about it. Now, the next big component is going to be momentum. And this is really prevalent when we have a lot of ice and snow on the roads, which is the mass of the object multiplied by its velocity the greater its mass or the greater its velocity, the greater its momentum. If a train was rolling at you at less than a quarter of a mile an hour, you are not going to be able to stop it because yes, its velocity is incredibly low, but its mass is gigantic. So this gives us the basic properties of whenever we're working with, oh, football players running at one another, whatever athlete has the greater momentum is the one that's gonna go ahead and drive back the other one. And that's gonna come down to, once again, that combination of mass multiplied by, vol by velocity. So if we have a 300 pound lineman running at a 150 pound lineman and literally a running back, and that 150 pound running back is going twice as fast as that lineman, he only has the ability to stop him even though he's literally going at twice the velocity. Now he's going to have what we are going to refer to as a greater kinetic energy, 
But at the same time, he has to be going twice the speed. And that becomes obviously pretty difficult to do when you're dealing with high level athletes that are going to be 300 pounds and not that much slower. If you look at the 40 times, yes, you get some backs that are running in the, you know, crazy speeds of like four, four to four, two, but you get a lot of linemen that are still running less than six second forties, which means still, if they got twice the weight on that person, the other guy's not going twice the speed. So you're going to have some problems. Now, Impulse is the change in momentum that we're going to see. Now, this means our change in force over our change in time. Now, we care about impulse because impulse is going to be a way that we're receiving these forces. So, for example, whenever you go ahead and try and do something like breaking boards, you're going to find that you have a pretty big change in force over a relatively small change in time. Now, obviously with training, the bones becoming denser in your hand, you're gonna be able to deal with greater forces that are being produced. However, you can obviously break your hand if those bones are not ready to receive that force in that period of time. So what we can then do is when we're looking at sports is we can try to increase the period of time that effectively we are receiving that force or producing that force. So whenever an athlete is throwing a javelin or going into a long jump, they actually are going to effectively lean with their body. And this in turn is going to give them a longer period of time to produce that force, which is going to give them a bigger change in momentum. So you'll see that going on with the takeoff where they'll overstride for the high jump. So they've got a greater contact time to produce that full force fully. And then same thing when they're throwing the javelin, lean back, so now they have a greater period of time while they're going forward, throwing it as they're posting up on that front leg. Now, when we're talking about sprinting, this is where we're going to see the greatest, longest contact times at the very beginning of the sprint, when we're getting ourselves up to speed and then trying to, once we're up to top speed, we have very, very little time on the ground. And that impulse is all about essentially maintaining our velocity, it's no longer about increasing our velocity. Think back to the first lecture when we showed you guys the slide of Usain Bolt uh, doing his, I think it was the, it was the, well, obviously it was like the 953 100 meter. And you can actually see his force production, his impulse on each of those. That's why those jagged lines are going. Now, when it comes to slowing down, we want to increase the period of time we're going to be receiving this force over. And so the greater job that we do of controlling our landings, absorbing force, the lower peak forces we're gonna have to deal with. So a great example of this, wherever you guys are at, you could stand up, jump as high as you can in the air and then land with your knees bolt straight. Don't let your knees bend, don't let your hips bend. And then, no, don't do that, that's gonna hurt. That's gonna feel bad. Whereas comparing that to landing, where you're going to actively try to land on your toes, letting your heels hit the ground, bending with the knees, bending with the hips, absorbing that force with your body, as opposed to just letting it jostle through your entire structure. Now, the other big component when it comes to dealing with force is pressure. So pressure is going to simply equal the force that's being applied divided by the area it's being applied. So for example, whenever anyone, it, it, this is an, an odd concept to think about, okay? When someone, you know, shoots another person, okay? Whether you're doing paintball, whether unfortunately we're talking with actual firearms, how much force does the gun kick back on the individual firing it compared to the force that the other person is hit with? Is it the same? Is it higher on the force of being hit by the projectile? Or is it higher on the force actually being exerted on the individual firing the projectile? Go ahead, guys. Uh, put up in the chat what you think it is. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So we only got three people who are paying attention this morning. I like it. Anybody else? There you go. Okay, we're up to four. Okay, so thank you guys. Now we're getting in there. Okay, now here's what's interesting. When someone fires a gun, the force that the gun is pushing back on them with is the same as the force that's being exerted on the bullet initially. Now, obviously, as the bullet goes through the air, if it's flying for a longer distance, thanks to drag, it's actually going to be hitting the target with a lower amount of force than it left the gun with. The key difference between the two is the surface area. If the way you fired a gun was there was a needle in the stock that was a couple inches long. If you're firing it at any gun, really, that needle is going to drive itself into the person firing it with a, well, with all of that force over that very small area. Whereas obviously bullets are much smaller and that's what's going to be hitting the other person. And that's where things like beanbag rounds in shotguns, it's essentially the same load, might be a little bit lower power, powder load than what you find from a normal projectile. But whereas if that was, you know, you know, dove shot or anything else, those BBs would be ripping through the individual because they have a much smaller surface area that that force is being exerted over. So the more you know. Also, this is why walking in Legos hurts like a son of a gun. Because now that pressure is, it's the same force of your body walking on the ground. It just happens to be on a much smaller area. And that's also why if someone's going to step on your foot or step on your, yeah, step on your foot or step on your hand, you prefer they do it with tennis shoes, not with like baseball spikes or, you know, any type of other or track spikes, because obviously that is a much, much smaller surface area. Now, we then have what's known as mechanical work. Now, this is going to be effectively how much work you have performed by exerting a certain amount of force over a certain distance, okay? Now, this is not the same as the physiological for or energy required to do things where you don't move, like an isometric. So for example, holding a handstand push-up, um, holding a plank for a long period of time obviously requires energy to hold those positions isometrically. But you're not actually doing any, in the physics sense, work because you're not moving any object over a certain distance. Now, we like to use the concept of work because it gives us an idea of how much energy someone is having to consume when they're doing different types of activities. So for example, if you were to go to the gym and squat with your friend that's seven feet tall, okay? Both you guys are going and squatting through a full range of motion and you both are squatting the exact same amount of weight. Who is gonna be performing the greater amount of work? Exactly. Because, and thank you very much, Anna, the taller person, because they happen to be covering a greater distance. Now, this is an important concept when you're working with athletes in that literally your taller, longer athletes have to do more work to do everything because they happen to have to carry things over a much greater range of motion. And then same type situation where if they've got like really long arms on the bench press, they've got a huge range of motion that they have to take that weight every single rep of every single set. And that obviously with its reality, it requires them to do more work. So when you're looking at, you know, the total amount of work people are doing, keep in mind, obviously, how far the objects need to move. 
And then in turn, understanding that, yes, thanks to physical differences, some folks literally are going to be doing more or less work in given distances. And the same to be said about walking X amount of miles. If you are taller than your friend, but your friend weighs about 50 pounds less than you, so you're the taller person and you're the heavier person, who's doing more work if you guys go and walk a mile? Exactly, because you just happen to have the greater amount of mass that has to be carried over the same distance. So that's why we're going to think about work because this is one of those properties of why, now I'm talking more like heteronormative couples here, but usually if like a couple starts working out together, a guy and a gal, and there's a size discrepancy between the two, of them, which is typically for the male side just because of gender differences, the guy tends to lose weight faster than the female simply because he has a heavier body that consumes more calories to do everything. And by the nature of that beast is going to burn more calories if they both go for the same run together because the person literally has a heavier body to carry. Now, once we understand mechanical work, then we can get to the thing we really care about in sport, which is power. And power is effectively force times distance divided by the time, or we can just think of it as work over time. So this is the ability to move a object in a shorter period of time. So for example, like you know, right now I'm at home and we'll see if my brother-in-law ever watches any of my lectures, which I doubt. We bought him a birthday present because we know who he is and we know what he's about. Also, uh, my brother-in-law is, uh, he's 31, 31. And I'm pretty sure he's going to be incredibly happy when he sees this. So I could take and walk baby Yoda and set him down over on the couch, which I won't because then my dog is going to probably get him all dirty. Or I can just throw baby Yoda over there. At the end of the day, it has moved the same distance. So the same amount of work has been performed. The key difference is the time component. So the throwing him across the room is the more powerful action when we're only accounting for where baby Yoda went. So that's why we care about power production, which is yes, you could go and obviously walk 40 yards or you can sprint it in less than five seconds. And that is the far more powerful one. And that's typically how a lot of sports are won and lost is it literally comes down to who is your more powerful athlete. In fact, think of it along this line, okay? When it comes to the cross country athletes, okay? The athlete that wins, okay? Do they produce the most power relative to their body weight compared to all of the other runners for that meet? Or is there anyone else that would have produced more power relative to their body weight? Nope, actually it doesn't matter. I said relative to their body weight, so it doesn't matter how big or small anyone is. In reality, guys, whoever wins, any race, one from the 100 meter to the marathon, it was statistically speaking, the athlete who had the highest average power relative to their body weight. Now, 
if we don't say relative to their body weight, yes, there is definitely potentially an athlete who obviously didn't run as fast, but is heavier. And so in turn produced a greater average power just because of the mass. But literally when we're looking at who won, it's always going to come down to who had the higher relative body mass. Math is fun. Okay. So let's go ahead and we're going to work through a couple problems here just so we can get a feel for it and see how you guys are doing with, you know, kind of picking this up since obviously we're going a lot of different thing here, a lot of different stuff here. Okay. Oh, well, there you go. So much for keeping that up there so you can see it. So now we're going to say that you can produce, okay, through your feet, 1,000 newtons of force. So that is the, once again, the force you're producing, okay? What would be the acceleration your body would have? N stands for Newtons. Newtons are the units for force. So remember, we have obviously know force equals mass times acceleration. We can then factor it. So we can take that force, divide it by our body mass, and that's going to give us our acceleration. Ugh. Sorry, guys. Yes, Marlana, follow the formulas. Now your body mass, remember guys, we're doing this all in the metric system, meaning you need to have your body mass in kilograms, which is taking your body weight in pounds and dividing that by 2.2. Yeah, yeah, that, that seems pretty realistic for just guesstimating size Things out, no offense, guys. A lot of you guys I have never met in person, so I don't have the best idea of how big uh, you guys are. I can definitely tell you flat out if you weigh more than 220 pounds, your acceleration is going to be slower than 10 meters per second squared. If you weigh less, or if you, yeah, weigh about or less than 110 pounds, it's gonna be closer to 20. Okay. Nice work, folks. 
Good. So now we're going to put you guys in groups and we're going to do five separate groups. Okay. And we're going to do, we're going to have a little fun with this. Now, of course I say that and other people are going to potentially disagree with me and that's okay. That is okay. So now The first question we're going to do is going to be with a peak force of, or with that force of a thousand newtons, okay? How fast would the projectile that you fire go? And so group one, you're going to be doing a basketball. So you're going to have to Google what is the weight of a basketball in kilograms and then figure out, okay, here's the acceleration. Same thing with a baseball golf ball, ping pong ball, which should be insane, and then paintball. Now, you guys are gonna go ahead and obviously figure out what was that acceleration, okay? Or sorry, what was, yeah, that acceleration. Now, after it's flown in the air for one second, so we're gonna say whatever the acceleration was, is now its velocity, so. Okay, so it's a two-parter. So then you're going to figure out what its momentum is. So that's where you're going to have, and now go and multiply its mass, because you've got that before, and multiply it by its velocity. And now you've got momentum. And we'll see what you guys come up with for both of those answers. Questions, comments, concerns, before I'm going to put you guys into the breakout rooms. And if you don't join the breakout room within effectively one minute, I'm just going to remove you from the lecture this morning. I'm saying this not to the guys that and gals that are going to do that, but because I have students that'll sign in and then walk away from their computer. And, you know, that way it seems like they're there for class, but they weren't. Questions, comments, concerns? You guys feel relatively comfortable with what's going on? It's almost 10 o'clock. I'm going to give you guys until at least 10.05, because remember, you got to figure out the mass in kilograms of the object, figure out its acceleration, and then after one second where it's acceleration same as velocity, figure out what its momentum would be. So shouldn't be too painful, but I've been wrong before. Okay. So have some fun, guys. All right, guys, welcome back. When you're ready, go ahead and paste in what was the results that you guys came up with for what was your projectile, what was the acceleration, and then what was your momentum? When you're ready, paste in what was your projectile, what was its momentum, and what was its acceleration. Go and paste that into the chat.
That's okay, Anna. So notice guys, since we had effectively accounted for the mass initially, all of you guys had nearly the exact same momentum. Notice it's just a rounding error for the difference. Yeah, it's pretty much a thousand for everybody. Okay. Does anyone have questions about kind of how it works when we're working with both the force equal mass times acceleration formula and uh, yes, you would just multiply the mass of your object multiplied by the acceleration you guys had. No, that was just meant to be a placeholder. So if we said it was, we waited two seconds and accelerated uniformly for that period of time, well then now you're gonna be going, you know, way, well, you'll double the speed you were going, double your velocity. But now we're gonna start getting the drag and everything else is gonna get really wonky. So I just wanted to do a simple example. We're only talking about being one second away, okay? So, All right, now, actually we're gonna go up. I don't know if that, drip, drip, drip. Now we're gonna do a pressure problem, okay? So pressure equals the force divided by the area, okay? Now, we're going to have your entire group, okay, is standing on, what does it say, an object with a point on the bottom, okay? How small does the point need to be in order to break the concrete. Now, here's the thing. If you're all standing on the object with the point on the bottom, here you're going to have the force equals the collective mass of the group times 9.81, because remember guys, that's our value that we're using for gravity. Because you just, it, right now I'm overcoming gravity. So I've got the mass of my body. That's also overcoming obviously the acceleration of gravity trying to pull me into the center of the planet because it's round. It's not flat, it's round. Because you're wondering. And then from there, okay, how small is the point you need to be? So what you need to do is figure out these values or figure out effectively what is the force, or sorry, what is the pressure, sorry, and then once you've got the pressure required to break concrete and you know your force, now we are going to have that area and we're going to move that around so we're going to be able to figure out what's going on there. So first and foremost, figure out what is the total force of your group, okay? Use good old Dr. Google to figure out what is the pressure required to break concrete, and then go ahead and figure out what would the area of that point need to be in order to break through. It's 10, 12. Do you guys feel like you didn't have long enough with those five minutes? You guys would want a little more time to do this one? Okay. 
Okay. All right, sounds good. So let's. Okay, okay. So it's ten thirteen. Let's plan on coming back at about ten twenty. Okay. So let me do you a favor also. And I've got that posted in there, guys, in the chat, so you can copy it over. So get after it. See you guys back at 1020. What did you guys come up with? Well, that's an acceleration. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Damn. Hmm. So what did you guys come up with for the mass of everyone in your group? And then Okay. Yeah. Taylor, that looks realistic. Good, Kristen, that math makes sense. And then did you come up with the same pressure for concrete? And then remember pressure, that's gonna be, you've got that in Newtons per what? Square meters? So remember four skies is in Newtons. So that's going to be, in kg multiplied by meters divided by second squared, that's mass times acceleration. Area is gonna be square meters, so m to the second power. And then pressure is simply gonna be the force divided by the area. So that's going to be kg m divided by s squared multiplied by m squared. And you get pressure by, really that's what you had to look up in Google to figure out what was the pressure required to break concrete. And then that allowed you to then mathematically infer what would have been the area. Yeah, no worries, guys. Let's work it on out. Okay, so go ahead and handy dandy. Okay, pressure required to break concrete. Okay, so regular concrete can typically withstand a pressure of about 10 million pascals or 1450 pressure pounds per square inch. Okay. So, oh, hi, kitty. You are going to the floor. Say hello to things, everybody, and say goodbye, things. Okay. So, we're going to go with the low end here, okay, of uh, 1450 PSI, okay? So, if we've got 1450 pounds per square inch, well, that's funky. I thought I was the next line down. I guess I was not. Okay, we're gonna say that I weigh about 95 kg today, okay? And then I have to multiply that by 9.81. And that's member meters per seconds, second square, okay? That equals the force of my body, okay? Now, we've got to convert this over into the metrics. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can use that if you want. I'm just going to go convert this over into uh, effectively the force over the area. So instead of pounds, we're going to have kilograms. And instead of inches, we're going to have meters. So you can, you can perfectly do that. So in order to do that, we're going to go ahead and multiply this. Instead of one square inch is going to be, gosh, it's probably closer to... Conversion there, that's going to be inches into centimeters, but we got to technically do it twice because we're going for square centimeters. And that's actually going to be divided by and divided by since it's going to be underneath this. And we're converting into kilograms, so we actually also need to Go ahead and divide this by point. Um, there's two point two pounds in every kilogram. So what is the zero point two five four? What's that? What is the zero point two five four? Where did you got that? That is the conversion of inches into meters. There, for every one inch, that equals 0 0.0254 meters. So we're going to have 1450 divided by 2.2. Divide that by 0 0.0254. And then divide that by 0 0.0254. So crazy big numbers. That should be adequate on my sig figs. Okay. So then I'll go ahead and hit clear. Take 95 times 9.81. That's going to equal my force in Newton. So we've got Pressure equals force divided by the area. So now I'm going to go ahead and divide that force by the pressure because we're going to cross multiply and divide. So that's going to give us 1021592.95. So that's times 10 to the fourth because now it's getting a little crazy. So effectively my pressure area is going to be 0 0000912. Which that's probably going to be closer to literally standing on a needle. Let's take a good one. Yes, once again, you can use Pascal's. Okay. So now, guys, let's go ahead. And we're going to do both a mechanical work and a power. Okay. So well, we've got <clears throat> this happy one that we've already got on there. Okay. So. Thank you. 
watts is going to be a power metric. And that's going to require you guys to go ahead and work backwards and figure out effectively if you know the total force of everybody, how much distance would you cover per second? And then you're going to be able to mathematically figure it out. So this is going in easy because this is just going to be solve for work, which is joules. Then you're going to solve for power, which is watts. And then we go hard mode, which is going to be time. It's 10.32. We'll plan on coming back together at about uh, 10.40, and then we'll wrap up for the day, OK? Work together in your groups. Use, obviously, your slides. Lose your, use your book. Use your notes. And then work your way through the math problems. And then once again, the cat wants to say hello. Say hello to Tinks. Back to the board, Peter Sinker. All right. Have fun, guys. Get after it. Great job, guys. Great job. Yeah, so you're just going to you know, start off by obviously multiplying the body mass already in the group by the acceleration of gravity and then by the distance. So, woo! Then you guys are going to, for your figuring out the actual uh, power to produce, do that in 20 seconds. Well, you've got your work that you just solved for and just divide that by 20. So hence why your power should be larger than your work. So yeah, good work. Nice. And then obviously to figure out the time. So how did you get the, the wattage? That's the power. So you're going to take that You've got the work that you guys performed moving collectively, and then you're going to go ahead and just divide that by 20 seconds because that's how long it took you to give you the power, the powers per second, watts. Convert it to joules and watt. The answer we got out of the formulas. So you're going to get joules from doing work. That's that's the unit for joules. Then you need to go ahead and divide by time because joules over time is power. So that's watts. And so, yeah. And the final one is, you know what your wattage is. So that's that thousand. You know what your work is, because we already solved for that. And we're still trying to figure out time. So if we multiply time by both sides and divide power on both sides, we're going to take that work you already have. So that first part of the answer, divide it by 1000, because that's the wattage, it's the power, and on the other side, that's going to equal the time. So good work, guys. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into kinetic energy and potential energy on um, Thursday. But otherwise, stay safe out there, guys. Do not uh, slip because hopefully it's not too icy where you guys are at. And otherwise, have yourselves a great day. Any other questions, comments, concerns before we call it? All right, guys. Well, then, stay safe out there. Have a great one. Bye-bye.